As I was thinking about this, uh, the senses are definitely about call and response. Because it's our senses that call us into this world, make us experience things, and we respond in turn. And I think it's that whole importance of the sensory presence of our being, of our experiences, that is crucial to our having a fuller understanding of history, of culture, of the making of persons as individuals, and the making of persons as social beings. I have brought together some incredible people who are very much in touch with their senses and working deeply on these matters, helping us to understand more deeply uh, our life experiences from various points of view. You're coming to a, what's called a symposium, but I hope your experience of it will be as a sensosium. <laughs> I think that the impact of semiotics being linguistically based has limited and distorted our understanding of the arts and of the sensory nature, the multisensorial nature of the things that we experience. Sensiotics is, um, is a play on, on that um, approach, and it suggests that we need to be aware of all of the senses that are happening simultaneously all the time, um, and, and that we privilege some over others, but that all of them are actually helping to um, help us understand uh, and, and experience uh, these situations. I came to this awareness from an experience that I had in, in Africa um, when I was a teacher there, and I apprenticed myself. I asked a Yoruba sculptor if I could become his apprentice, and he agreed, and I worked with him for about seven or eight months. And that apprenticeship with that Yoruba sculptor was the thing that made me understand that I had to embody the knowledge that he possessed as the master who was teaching me. Because it was really embodying what he was showing me and presenting to me that made me have a new idea of Yoruba aesthetics and Yoruba style and what artists, Yoruba artists, are looking for in creating their work. And Gelede is about carved mass, but it's also about costume, it's about choreography, it's about music, it's about song. Uh, I was interested in the relationship of the arts in these multisensorial, multimedia experiences that Yorubas uh, take as onna, or evocative form, art, in its deepest sense. Now, in my work with the Yoruba, as I try to define and understand the kind of Yoruba sensorium, I'm working with, at present, seven senses, the typical five plus another two, because I think motion, as you can see in the importance of these dance performances, is a separate and distinct um, sense that is very much appreciated by the Yoruba. Um, the sense of motion, that is one's movement uh, in the field of gravity in this world. Uh, it's about issues of personal moral balance within that space and movement within that space, something that Catherine Geertz has talked about in her work among the Eve. The notion of balancing and standing on two feet is when you become human. Well, for the Yoruba, there are a number of wonderful sayings about motion or about movement. One is that, Aiduru, Ijoni, not standing still is dancing. And then another one that I love very much because it talks about the agency of movement in people's lives. The Yoruba say, stretch out your leg and let dance catch it. Those two things, I think, convey something of the importance of motion. And the final one, uh, illustrated by these two images, is what I'm calling suprasensory perception, what we call ESP, extrasensory perception, because the Yoruba, and I think all cultures, have this concept. You know, there are those moments when we go into altered states, and those are just not mental states. Those are bodily and mental states. 
It's happening to us holistically. We go into an altered state of consciousness that some people call trance, that other people will call feeling in flow. Well, for the Yoruba, this is crucial, and I think probably in religious experience in probably almost all parts of the world, there is this notion of going to a place that's beyond, that's a, that's a, a little bit beyond where we are in our normal sense of reality and being. So in those late 80s, early 90s, you find um, all of a sudden an anthropology of the senses springing up, a history of the senses and so forth. All of these disciplines converging um, on the senses and these various subfields um, emerging. And so why was there that interest in the senses? Why did it take shape then? Well, partly it was a reaction to the linguistic term, um, the textualism of anthropology and history at that time. Anthropology, it was the writing culture movement where everything was about textualization and the senses were lost sight of as a result of that em emphasis on narrative, on language, and so forth. We had to bring the senses back. It was also partly because of the rise of visual anthropology, which at least got us beyond words and into both film images and sound images. Uh, so visual anthropology has an important impact in terms of enlarging uh, the number of senses that anthropologists are bringing to their work because they're starting to film, they're starting to take images um, because of the way in which that technology was a lot more easy to handle at that point. Um, but it's also, I think, because of a mutation within the practice of participant observation. And that was the, the traditional practice within anthropology. You went and you, you lived with people, you observed their practices while participating in their lives. And I call that mutation the mutation to participant sensation. The mutation to participant sensation, or sensing, um, along with the people you are studying. Now, there are lots of anthropologists who are actually doing this before um, sensory anthropology ever comes to be talked about in the early 90s. Henry is an example. By apprenticing himself as a carver, he learns through his body how to internalize certain ways of cer sensing, certain ways of doing, um, and that explains his engagement with the senses throughout this, this whole process. The problem with historical texts is that they don't give you any smells or any touches or anything like that, um, but if you sense between the lines, if you learn how to actually reconstruct imaginatively the sensory experience that is embedded in those lines, um, you can sort of reconstruct whole sensory. In addition to doing a history of the museum, looking at its sensory history in particular, um, what you find increasingly um, is um, also changing curatorial practices. Um, initially, uh, you know, white gloves and only sort of curators being allowed to touch things has been replaced, for example, at the Canadian Museum of Civilization with twice each year shamans uh, from uh, the Mohawk uh, people coming and actually feeding the masks, the, the false face masks, um, that uh, actually, um, that involves turning off the uh, alarm system so you can have a smudge you know, with, with smoke uh, and sort of putting cornmeal on the mask itself because these are living beings, they're not just objects. So good curatorial practice now recognizes that, recognizes that objects have sensory appetites and appeases them um, in just this kind of way. Um, so this is just a, you know, a, a formal introduction to the tremendous richness that awaits us uh, today. And I thank them once again for having brought us together here to exchange um, at a sensory intellectual level um, in this amazing new domain um, which opens up um, in the wake of the sensory revolution. The thing about objects, and this is what makes them different from film on the one hand or a monograph on the other, is that they are multi-sensory and they can draw us out. And that's why the museum has a responsibility to engage with the senses, um, because it's not just the two-dimensionality of film um, or you know, whatever the, the aspect of writing is. Um, so there, I think, um, you know, these sorts of, uh, of ways in which partly to capture people's attention by making things more interactive. Uh, you know, you've got museums experimenting in some really intriguing ways, but we can go so much further. And one of the things that I'd like to see, um, for example, um, where there are reliquaries or, or, uh, or this kind of thing, is that before people go into the room, they're, they're, they're schooled in how to prostrate themselves properly and how to kiss these things, you know, or, or replicas of them. Uh, because you're not sensing it properly unless you do. Uh, so uh, wonderful opportunities there. Museums, I think, as they go through the sensory term, 
uh, are beginning to do that now. How Henry got away with some of the things that he did in the Mamiwata <laughs> exhibition, uh, that takes a real forceful character uh, who's able to, to sort of get beyond security and hygiene and other kinds of issues, uh, and, and sort of you know, more power to him for that. Uh, but this is the obligation, um, and as I say, good curatorial practice now recognize these as living beings and not just objects. I think that so often the objects are set aside as sort of this separate thing and, and, and that that's what this is about is the object when it's really about the experience and so you're creating this whole context around the object but, and, and having these other things be part of it and it really it changes what museums are about and it changes how people f understand both what it is they're seeing and what, how it relates back to themselves and so it's just I, it's really wonderful to see this and, and it's great to hear the um, uh, the examples of where this is going on. For us at the Children's Museum, it's about engagement. It's not about an object. The object is, is not as important. Uh, the story and the communication and the engagement is the most important. My father had a great impact on my life you know, as, a, as a thinker. And he would take me every six weeks to this gentleman called Mr. Wright. Mr. Wright was the local barber, local barber and oracle. And as a young child, I began to realize as I would sit in his house, because sitting in his house in the 70s, there were no barber shops in the UK that the banks would lend money for. So I'd go to this person's house, I would smell tobacco, um, they'd be playing dominoes, they'd be drinking Ray and Nephew white rum, so all these smells and sounds that I would be a part of. And I would watch these sculptors, I call them sculptors, through the laying on of hands, you know, creating these wonderful shapes and hearing these wonderful stories that would somehow begin to shape my own understanding of the world, my own understanding of Britishness, identity, and logic. It was a fully sensorial experience. He was a monk. Yeah, he was a, he was a book reader. And every barber that I had known growing up over the years as a young person had that sensibility about it, <coughs> that way in which they could, they could guide and, and advise and inform. And that laying of hands was a really important moment. And I know, as I learned to cut hair when I was a student, began to realize that laying of hands would have an effect on me. So I would meet a client, and they may be having some type of emotional trauma in their life, or feeling down, I would take that from them, take it home with me, inside of my essence, and my wife would feel it. And I began to realize I had to go through a process of cleansing when I came home. I learned that, it took me a few years to learn it. I did a performance some years ago, a long time ago. I was cutting this lady's hair, white lady's hair, and it was very long, but I did this, and she said she wanted a funky pattern palm tree with, you know, the kind of skyline. So I began to use scissors first to cut the hair away, the length. Then I used the machine. And as the machine was going through, the machine was jarring. <coughs> and I looked under her hair, and it was just like mine. It's the lady with, you know, aquiline features, blonde hair, light skin. She had hair just like mine. My sister said, what, what is this? The top leg of it was, was straight. Her grandfather, I think it was from Zimbabwe. Her entire life, she had spent relaxing her hair, bleaching her hair in an attempt to run away from her history, to run away from who she is. So for me, the hair is, is an interesting signifier of our, of our lineage, and I'm kind of fascinated by it. I noticed I go into kind of a semi-trance when I watch people get their hair done or get their hair combed, and I notice that I'm kind of going into it now. <laughs> I see a complete stranger, 
They look at me like, I hope this guy can do a good job. Within 15 minutes, they're telling me their life story. 15 minutes. And for me, I've been a part of a number of those exchanges where people make this transition, this rite of passage, almost like a homecoming or a kind of a resolution about their, their self and through this process of their own hands. It's not just an activity of making money, it's just about this wonderful moment where people can transform themselves. Kids approach a piece of paper as an area for an experience. It's an area for an experience. Um, and they mess around till they find something. Adults, or when this thing changes at around, in adolescence usually, the paper becomes a thing. And again, we're talking about this museum and stuff. We're talking about something going from an experience like the icon to a thing. I'm gonna give you one minute with your eyes closed to draw a comb. We're gonna do the same thing, eyes closed, you have one minute. Do your best, draw a pair of scissors. Go. Be brave. <laughs> Mm. Your hand knows all about it. Mm -hmm. Nice, beautiful work. Take, take, oh, nice, good. All right, well done. I am holding a drawing, and I am going to describe the drawing to you, and y'all are going to draw it. All right? So the, the drawing I'm holding, which I don't want you to see, the mother image, as I'll call it, is of a creature. Big circle head, alien eyes pointing inward, Nose upside down, heart, mouth, a wiggly thing with uh, four, four um, hills, body like a triangle with the top cut off, six uh, relaxed tentacles, arms, two branches going straight up with five twigs on the end, berries on the end of each one, flame on the top of the head, in the center on, on its chest is a bird singing. It's a profile uh, facing to the left. Bye. Your job is to turn that first scribble into a monster. You'll have one and a half minutes. Go! Come, brother, come, let's lift it. Come now, hew it, roll away. Shackles gonna fall on the judgment day, but let's not wait for it. My assistants and I are going to hang your monster pieces there so that you'll be able to find your question. And then the other work we're going to hang in the window of the image lab so your work will be immediately on display for the world to see. And when we have our lunch break, you'll get to go see your exhibition. I see some of my wonderful colleagues in the audience today. Uh, participating in this strong drawing session, and that's good. I want to see your monsters. See if I recognize any of our other colleagues. <laughs> so, Marguerite Hatcher is doing her PhD uh, in uh, African art uh, history and visual culture, and she's uh, doing her work in uh, uh, northeastern Tanzania. Uh, just came back from a field trip there this uh, summer, doing language and research study. Uh, she's going to be talking to us about the topic of her dissertation research, Objects as Bodies, Bodies as Objects, Medicine and the Arts Among the Shamba of Tanzania. Let's give her a warm welcome. The Shamba peoples of northeastern Tanzania categorize as medicines many ritual objects that we display as art in museums. Although the medicine objects make little or no visual reference to bodies, some are seen as living entities. My project prompts a reevaluation of Shamba figurative art and performance. It proposes that among the Shamba, the lenses of Uganga, initiations, and art medicines portray the body as a dynamic nexus that facilitates restorative reciprocities among spirit, human, and environmental phenomena. phenomena. It further suggests that Shamba art medicines are not organized according to verisimilitude, but to Im imminent experiences of sensing bodies that are conceived as fluid and coterminous with the spirit and material worlds. My goal today is to illustrate how inquiries into local, long-standing notions of health and healing can yield insight into Shamba consumptions of the body, processes of objectification, the spaces between subjects and objects, 
and how they can help us to reevaluate artworks that African art history categorizes as non-figurative. In July of 2013, while doing pre-dissertation field work in Tanzania, I had an illuminating conversation with an elderly Shamba healer, Bibi Salome. According to Shamba understandings, there is an intangible but powerful physical connection between a mother and her baby that continues long after pregnancy. The connection is also reflected and the baby's health similarly affected by the mother's behavior independent of her interactions with the child. For example, if a woman who was recently given birth has sex with a man who is not her husband, the newborn will grow weak. Shamba peoples perceive fluidities among bodies, and similarly, among bodies and the natural world. The space in between mother and baby seems to function in bodily ways. It seems to operate as a corporeal-like conduit through which both healing and illness are conferred. The body-body continuities described by Salome unfold spatially and are not determined by physical proximity, but by movement. If, for example, a mother leaves her newborn at home and walks several miles to the market, the physical connection she has with the child remains intact. The connection is broken only when the baby acquires physical agency. When viewed through the lens of Shamba medicine, the body appears as coterminous with its social and physical surroundings. Those who helped construct African art as a category gave overwhelming priority to objects from Africa that bore a visual resemblance to items in the natural world. They were particularly interested in works that referenced the human body, however abstractly. Not only were many important creative genres eschewed, but whole segments of the continent without overt figurative traditions were excluded from art history's map. Perhaps, for example, the supposed dearth of figurative, figurative imagery in Shamba art history can be attributed to differences between Euro-American and Shamba conceptions of the body. It's the array of beaded and banana leaf accoutrements once worn in female initiations, for instance, can be understood as figurative artworks, making visible continuities among bodies and landscapes in Sh Shamba healing contexts. I believe that inquiries into, tra into traditional approaches to health and healing among the Shamba provide an important counterbalance to art history's overemphasis on vision. They prompt the realization that those who created the category of African art might have discerned a rich figurative tradition in German East Africa if only they had known how to sense it. Catherine's work has been very inspirational to me. Um, she wrote. Uh, based on her dissertation, a book entitled Culture and the Senses, Bodily Ways of Knowing in an African Community. And she worked among the Ando Ebe in southeastern Ghana and Togo, um, a culture that has so many resonances with um, things that I know from the Yoruba country. And in fact, they are probably historically and, and culturally linked sometime from the past. You are receiving a small painting, a very tiny painting in a cup. My daughter is distributing those right now. And I would invite you during this, this presentation to um, take your cup and come and please help yourself to some lemon water. Please come up if you feel moved and take fruit for the tactile experience. Cecilia Lama. It literally means perceive, perceive at flesh inside. And it comes from the Ebe language spoken in Ghana, Togo, and Benin. It's an out of awareness phenomenon, a foundational schema, the principle of regulated improvisation, which is produced phrasing. People don't consciously set out to rely on Sasilalama as they dance, sing, carve, or cook just as most of us would not consciously think. I'm going to walk through the park drawing on Cartesian dualism. <laughs> Cartesian dualism spawns or generates a kind of mind-body split. Cecilia Lama spawns or generates mind-body fusion. For several years, I've been studying the work of Philadelphia-based artist James Dupre exploring the ways in which his mixed media work exemplifies this foundational schema 
of Cecilia Lama, or feeling in the body, flesh, and skin. In the late 1970s, he remembers himself throwing sound at canvas while thinking about the early jazz impresarios who were masters of improvisation. This launched his career as a visual artist whose work, more often than not, renders visible what is heard and felt in music. Caked thick with acrylic paint, the surface textures combine with light and sweeping shapes to help evoke a kind of movement of acoustics and color. The first collaboration that Dupre and I did was in the mid-1990s when he mounted an exhibit at Rutgers University for my Art of Africa course. The series he was working on at that time, SP4648, utilized brooms in the construction of what I saw as an African-inspired fusion of mask to staff. We later worked together as I wrote about two of his exhibits and composed a piece, James Dupre Materializing the Blues. So I was familiar with his long-standing use of masks and visage in expressing angst and pain. 13th century poet Rumi wrote, the body is a device to calculate the astronomy of the spirit. Look through that astrolabe and become oceanic. Not only have masks of desperation and despair revealed Dupre's sensing of the state's abuse of power, but he has also been spewing out dozens of small iconic bodies exuding an astronomy of the spirit. I'm going to do what I'm getting very, very, very used to doing, which is performing and presenting at the same time. My work has been inspired greatly by Kathleen Lingertz. And again, an amazing moment to see how she's transferred her work on Cecil Lamin in Ghana to applying it to connect with art practices here in America. Similarly, I have been looking at the subject of improvisation and applying it to my own work with contemporary artists in London and in California. I've come up with a plan to be able to understand the foundation, the, the matrix that's underneath this creativity that is bountiful and never seems to come to an end. So I've called it Embodiology. In a sense, it's my translation of Cecil Lama. It is a multi, poly, cross integration of many forms of beingness. The rhythm is not a thing of just dividing time, but it's a sensation that comes from the inside. And it's only through connecting with what's on the inside that we can actually experience time. In a way that is complex and integrates with those of others. We kind of have to resist our own preferences for dividing things in order to get to the center of where their truth is. So, the bell pattern from a dance that's called Atsia Togo. Can you hear the time that's under my step?
understanding that rhythm is not only about the time, it's about feeling the space and the suspension. That enables you to connect and be able to then speak to that space, to be able to create, to be able to innovate, to be able to occupy a space where you're actually communicating with others. We find that the, the, the arts are sort of battling for resources, so you know, dance has to stand by itself and music has to stand by itself. And I, I think there's a, a great richness if we were able to truly get together within the academy to really have that experience. Um, and I keep trying uh, to do that in my own institution. At the center of a private garden murmurs a shimmering fountain. Its cool water perfumes the surrounding air with a myriad of scents, myrtle, rose, and citrus, evoking memories of exotic locations and fabled myths. As the scented, sparkling liquid cascades over the fountain surface, it automates a chorus of bells that perforate the heavy air. Buoyant with desire, floating with adoration, the lovers fuse with the fountain, flowing and spilling among its succulent perfumes, rhythmic bells, and glistening water. 700 years later, this fountain sits silent and waterless, and its enchanted lovers are dead and forgotten. Still, this apparatus resonates with wonder and imagination, seducing modern viewers with its gleaming ornamentation and intricate craftwork. Constructed in the first half of the 14th century in northern France, this fountain now resides in the Cleveland Museum of Art. In this paper, however, I wish to focus on the sensory impact of this apparatus on the beholder. In particular, I will explore this fountain's role as an automaton that mixed reality and imagination together in its cascading waters. Through magical and mechanical power, I contend that this device simulated the fabled fountains and gardens of love, so popular within medieval romance literature, into a material reality. Medieval automata, such as the Cleveland Table Fountain, likewise challenged artificial limits typically imposed between self and other. Mechanically alive, they confuse the relationship between living bodies and lifeless matter. Thus, while automata seeming, seemingly play tricks on our senses, mimicking the world of living things, they in fact reveal an essential truth. Our own experience of ego and, or self is a simulation of our senses. We produce ourselves from encounters with other objects, agents, or machines. Our being is coupled intricately to the external world our sense and feeling injected into all we encounter. The Cleveland Fountain connects the viewer to this marvelous truth, revealing a material world whirring and humming with animation. Situated within the intoxicating Chambre d'Amour, the fountain animated an ethereal garden of tapestries, flowers, and perfumes. Its shining waters beckoned the viewers forward, trapping them like the fountain of Narcissus and repelling their own amorous quest. Its ringing bells and perfumed liquid, liquid further courted the senses and automated the desire flowing within. Through the senses, body can join with object, casting the lover's desire into material form. The body fountain, moving and ephemeral like love itself, ruptured the barriers between unconscious matter and effervescent feeling, spilling everything together in its sparkling water. It is ultimately this capacity that makes the automaton so intriguing. While static artworks might certainly provoke a sense of wonder or desire in the beholder, this fountain moved and produced auditory and olfactory sensations for its audience. These effects provoked complex embodied responses in its viewers, which are rarely accounted for in scholarly literature. Thus, this apparatus raises important questions about our own approaches and interpretation to the study of objects. Material is not numb. It feels because we feel as we project our experience onto the material world. While this fountain now sits quietly in a museum, we must remember that it once lived, possessing a remarkable mechanical agency of love and desire. So this might take us back to some of the earlier discussions this morning about the sort of simultaneity of sensory experience more than synesthetic right. combined senses. And again, that has some parallels in medieval mystical literature in which you are simultaneously tasting and, and touching or sometimes you are um, tasting what you see. You know, you're, you're tasting something that is beautiful. It is the whole expression of, of sweetness that is part of the ecstatic, mystical experience, for example. You know, interestingly, 
um, the hierarchy varies over time. Like, for example, at certain times, speech is considered a sense, a sixth sense. Uh, the genitals are considered a sense. There are the spiritual senses. In fact, there are so many senses. There are the internal senses. Um, actually, imagination is not a faculty of cognition, the way we think of it is, but a faculty of sense. Um, the, the, I think that the, the sensoriality um, of the Middle Ages is really what is, is key. To me, sensory studies, studies is so important because it's, getting, it's giving a recognition to all of those emotions, feelings, things that are beyond verbal expression that, that we use metaphors for in the language because we can't get at it in any other way but go around it. I'm going to play for you Hades Blues, and it's by uh, saxophonist composer named Ralph Bowen. Uh, this features Ralph Bowen on tenor saxophone, Warren Evans on piano, uh, uh, Kenny Davis on the bass, and Donald Edwards on the drums. to us about the Ebe people, we're going to take that cycle of 16 bars and we're just going to keep reinventing it. His solo was a little over two minutes and a piece that lasted a little over four minutes long. And you heard that it started slowly and it kind of built and built. You got more rhythmic density, you got more speed, you got more uh, uh, kind of energy and that kind of thing. So it, it has this, this dramatic arc to it. We all know that, that uh, diagram when we study drama in high school or in college, that you have the exposition, that you have the rising action, the climax, the falling action, and the denouement. So uh, Ralph Bowen patterned his solo, I, I'm going to argue, uh, largely uh, in that kind of a structure, and that's a pretty common thing for uh, jazz improvisers to do. Did you hear him slide down his horn? He put a little ornament in there. And that's very deliberate, because he's thinking, OK, I already played the head once. What can I do this time to bring something new to it? Brother walking down the street, and 
you know, mm. everything's fine, and then you just change the step up a little bit, you know? <laughs> that's, that's, that's what that is. That's what Ralph just did. Now, we're going to get down to business. We're going to get into eighth note filled passages. Do 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 We're going to move this thing forward. We're going to give it a lot of momentum. I'm going to outline all these chord substitutions. I'm going to start giving you a lot of uh, meat, a lot of material to deal with. And then he does this expanding gesture where he takes that figure and he and he opens it up. And I, you know, just where you think you couldn't go any further, it goes a little bit further. That's what I'm arguing is the climax. I want to propose, first of all, that there is a rhetorical argument at work here. There, there is rhetoric and that uh, these musicians are trying to pull us into an experience. They're trying to tell us a story. They're, in tra they're trying to engage many senses. One, two, three, 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 one, two, three. And you see how sophisticated it, it gets. And this is what our composer is demanding of us. Because if we can't do that with complete freedom, we can't improvise. Uh, how you shape a note, or what we call coloring a note, will change uh, the expression, what you want to get across. I could do all kinds of different things. I could have the tongue touch the reed really lightly. Completely different effect than... And I want you to look at what he does physically when he's playing. Now, when I was studying with Ralph, he would say, I want you to reduce your movements to what is absolutely necessary to make the sound that you want to make, and nothing else. No extraneous movements. And I want you to play with your eyes open, don't squint, don't move your eyebrows, don't move anything here. This should be completely relaxed, except what you need to make the sound on the instrument. And he had brought this to a level of mastery that I'm still in awe of today, and he decided that for him as an artist, in order to get uh, the music to a more expressive level, he was going to take away a lot of the physical indicators. But I wonder, because I grew up going to jazz, and a part of what we understood that as young people was that we're going to watch the jazz musicians dance. And a part of that dance, the music was a result of the dance. So the performance of the jazz was this, this, this dance, this physical communication that was happening on stage. And I wonder, once you start to apply um, those technical modalities to the actual performance, how that impact or then affect the embodiment of the form, um, the cultural undercurrent of the form, the why we're making this music and sharing this, you know? Mm -hmm. I was told that in order to understand immediacy, you have to understand jazz. So how can we share this moment, this immediate thing that can only happen now, if that is removed? The, the thing that we can't see um, using that technique, what is going on for the saxophonist on the inside of his body, mm. what, what additional um, control his organs have uh, acquired through isolating in that way. And then I also think about his mind. Where does his mind go imaginatively by being in that sort of zen place? Does that give him another space to play and dance in? That we I, can't see. He has access to a lot more vocabulary musically when he's when he's being still, which is why he made that decision. That's what he wanted. Chris has been the artistic director of the First Wave program. He has taken First Wave on international and national tours to great acclaim. He is himself an acclaimed choreographer and has had a long and distinguished career with the National Dance uh, Theater and Company of Jamaica.
I've been in conversations recently a lot about movement and dance and what is movement and what is dance and how they differ and like it's all irrelevant. In many cultures, right, there is there isn't a separate word for the two. Right? And in Jamaica, we always talk about music and dance. Right? When we talk about our dance forms, we don't even talk about the music forms and the dance forms. We call them ring play. Right? So dance and music aren't even words that we use. They become play in a ring. One of the first things I want you to just get your body into a position of work. How are you usually? when you're at work. You see some people writing on a chalkboard, on a dry erase. Some people are drawing, right? Some people are looking, right? Some people are on the phone. So there's a elbow movement of the phone to the ear. In order to get through spaces, we have to get to work, and sometimes we have to get to the bathroom, sometimes we have a meeting across the hall. We have to travel from point A to point B. All of these movements are called locomotion. Anything that gets you from point A to point B. Right, right? So even the end, the bus moved to the left, right? So all these things, right? And the bus made a sudden stop. So you're on your way to work in a daily, you're, you're in a choreographed space. You're in a space that is pre-prepared to get you into the body that you need to get into to do the work that you're going to do that day. On your way to work, there was an accident, you're delayed, right? Are you in the same body? On your way to work, your car didn't work, you had to jump on the bus. Are you in the same body? Yeah, so these are questions I'm asking you. How does movement impact our ability to be ourselves? Are you the same person being up close to all these people, irrespective of how you feel about them, than you were when you were sitting by? I want you to just take an internal map of self, how you're standing, how your arms are hanging from your shoulders, where your head is atop your spine. Slowly bend both knees and straighten them. Rock forward a little bit, do not fall. So a lot of our faculty indeed are looking at the reintegration of mind, body, expression, self, spirit, right? Um, whereas 20th century dance was concerned with the technical training of the body, 21st century dance has to be concerned with innovation, right? Access to information and innovation. And so it's the dancer centered in self as a collaborator and contributor. So in order to prepare that person, all of these things, how you're accessing space on a daily basis, how you're accessing each other, how cultural information inform how you receive and then therefore project. So all of that is a part of it. Our lives are concept movement, but through movement, we improve the next step. That would be the pun intended, right? <laughs> so through movement, we improve the next step that we make because through movement, we understand our physicality better. But it's all about learning and packing on information and everything informing the next thing. When we skip those stages, we kind of have to go back. And that's why we have this whole field of body-mind integration, because it shouldn't have been separated in the first place. For many years, as a lot of you know, I've used hair as a ready-made portrait, this idea that it's a stand-in for the individual, but it also is kind of a stand-in for our collective identity in as much as it holds our DNA. So that is, that it holds all the people that have come before us. I made this abacus, which you see here, um, using my own hair as a stand-in or a synecdoche for all African Americans, and I decided I wanted to measure time because that's one thing that we can do with hair, how long our hair grows, you know. Um, and I said, well, what, what am I going to measure in time? And I decided that since I was using my own hair as a synecdoche for the African American presence and um, African American history, that I would measure the year from the Emancipation Proclamation until the present time. Here's the thing. I've been married to a musician um, for 19 years, and it took me quite a while to make this connection between hair and hair bows. These objects for me held the potential to hear the voices of our collective identity. And so I sourced 30-inch long straight 
seemingly blonde hair. And then I made a dreadlock. I've never had dreadlocks, but I made a dreadlock from the hair that I combed out of my own hair and felted into a dreadlock. The difference between an Ngungun scene in a museum and an Ngungun dance is to me the difference between this being an object, a bow rehaired with my DNA, versus it being, being an object that is played. When we're hearing the sound that is made from the DNA of our ancestors, we are implicated in that. The object that we hold is implicated in the, being a sponge for that sound as well. All of these things layered into a chorus of meaning, touch, and sound. In a way, because it's ordinary things, transported entirely to the realm of poetry, and my imagination is I'm going back in history because of the haunting quality of the sound, even if I hadn't heard the story entirely. I'm somehow thinking of the woman in Asia who grew the hair when you sent it around and I felt it and tried to understand what it would be like to cut it and that it was dyed blonde is a whole other bizarre sort of part of the story. Um, and then there's in a sense, the ordinariness of the musical object. I felt like I went into a time I knew about, read about, but had an experience. Mm -hmm. The idea of just the here and what it represents for centuries, for generations, and then to hear it speak was really humbling, and I want to thank you. You have enlivened Ancestor for me in a way that I never got from any of my anthropological reading. There are no words to end this conversation because this is a conversation that is ongoing and that I hope will grow. I leave you with this. Tell as many of your friends as possible and your enemies to come to their senses. <laughs>